And we are back. Okay, so oof, I have my delicious peppermint tea here. You guys should get yourselves a tasty beverage if you haven't, because we're in for not as long of a video as the previous one, or hopefully not. So um, we're going to move on from Buddhism and the Genpei War to the Tales of the Heika, which is your second reading for this week. I'll share that. All right, let's scroll down here. Actually, let's move me out of the way for a second and then cl collapse that a bit. Okay. So, do, 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 do. okay. So, the, okay, the, the first thing you have to understand about the, the Heike Monogatari is it's sort of, it's a text that evolved a lot over time. So, the text as we have it is from roughly the middle of the 14th century. So, by that, it's actually from the very end. The text, so, so sorry, let me be clear. The text comes from the very end of the Kamakura period. But it reflects events that occurred at the very beginning. Part of the reason for that is because it has a kind of oral history that precedes it, and I'll, I'll get into that in, in, in a little bit. It's a complex document, like so. But anyway, bear in mind that a lot of it is sort of reflective. It's looking back, and the reason why, strangely enough, I wanted to begin with <laughs> begin the unit with a text that looks back in this way is because that that sense of sort of like looking back in a sort of melancholy way is actually very indicative of the period as a whole and it also doves to because pure land buddhism comes up so much in the text it sort of dovetails nicely with this week's other reading okay so a, a couple of we a couple of interesting things about actually i, I just let me stop the share for a sec because i just realized something i'm going to need to share sound as well Okay, because um, <clears throat> I'm going to play a video in a sec, and so hopefully it won't be too loud. <laughs> it might actually be too loud. Uh, all right, so he, he, so here's the thing. The, the, the Tales of the Heike are technically a monogatari, um, which is kind of a misnomer because it's actually a really long narrative poem. Um, and historical or at least people assume scholars assume that it, it's a, a long narrative poem that has been kind of it's very episodic in nature so they assume that it's been assembled from various like oral performances that would have been common throughout the kamakura period and the sort of this is a document that is turned into a literary text from an oral environment um and this long and these these episodes in this poem are were originally performed to uh, the biwa, which is a kind of lute. Um, since many of you um, taking this course are, you know, of East Asian descent, you're probably familiar with the Chinese lute or the pipa, um, which is a beautiful instrument. It's lovely. The biwa is not <laughs> a, a lovely instrument. It's like someone someone decided at some point in Japanese history to take this beautiful Chinese instrument and make it sound bad. <laughs> it's really kind of horrible. Like, okay, I'm, I'm biased. Maybe you guys really love the Biwa. I do not love the Biwa. I think it sounds like cats eating themselves. Um, but yeah, so, but to that end, before I get into sort of talking about the text itself, I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of like what this sounds like. Now, this is a modern recreation. This is a modern performance of the 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 opening episode in the um the tales of the heike performed by oh what's her name um is it kawamura kyokuho i think is how that's read I'm, I'm guessing i haven't actually looked up her name i think this is read kyokuho anyway so she's playing the the chikuzen biwa which is a, a type of biwa um this is actually the same word in chinese as the instrument that it's derived from but as you'll for those of you who are familiar with chinese instruments you'll see very quickly that this is a very different sort of beast so with that in mind let me turn down the volume about there because i don't it might be too loud anyway let's take a look Gion Shoja. She's just going to perform the so from the tales of Heike Monogatari, Gion Shoja, the first vignette, and there it is again in Romaji and <laughs> Gion Shoja. Sorry, I'll shut up. Kokoho, I was right. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, I'm going to pause it there. I will link to this this video in the assignment for this week, so that way you guys can watch the full thing you want. Um, I also chose Kawamura's performance particularly because her voice is incredibly beautiful, like hauntingly beautiful. The biwa is a terrible instrument, but I mean, the performance is great simply because um, Kawamura is such an excellent um, biwa reciter. It's just a shame that she chose to play such an awful instrument. Um, Okay, so to go back to sort of the the the, the prosody of, of the poem, I noted. So this is what's sort of weird about. So this is um the Japanese text of the the. So this is the Gion Shoja um, vignette, and you see it's pretty short. It's not super long. Um, uh, it actually scans as poetry. So you have okay. So right here, so gi o n sho u ja no. That's seven seven syllables. Do remember. Oh, sorry, I forgot to include the null. So we got seven syllables there. Kane no kowe, five, seven, five. Sho, gyo, mu, sorry. <laughs> Sho, gyo, <laughs> mu, jo, u, no, seven. And then, ah. Hibiki ari, five. So it's the it's the classic like waka pattern. It's you know seven syllables. So it's it's similar to a choka. It's, it's different because chokas usually start with five. They go five seven five seven five seven. In this case, it's seven five seven five seven five. But it's still that sort of fundamental like Japanese verse form. It's a poem. It doesn't look like a poem. It's printed as prose, <laughs> and is um, often translated as prose. And to be honest, like I've asked Japanese scholars on many occasions why this is, because you know I'm not I'm not a specialist in in this in this era. I'm more of a, a modern specialist, um, and I've never really gotten a satisfying answer to this question. It's like, why is it printed like this? Why is it translated like this? And they're like, cause <laughs> just cause. So even though it's it's a written tale, it has that clear oral component. And the reason why that the the orality of it is important is because that's what signals it as sort of a, a form of popular literature as opposed to sort of like high literary art. It sort of became high literary art by the way in which like as a written text, it appropriated this oral tradition. But it's really sort of the 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 oral tradition is show, shows it sort of like its populist roots. And that's really fundamental to the the tale as constructed, and also the way in which it relies heavily upon this new populist religion, namely Pure Land Buddhism. So let's get, and okay, one more thing I want to add about this, and, the, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you guys listen to it being recited and not just reading the translation that I'm going to post, is because that there is a feel to it that is that is dark, 
that is heavy. It's not the sort of like, it's not the melancholy of the Heian period anymore. It's not that sense of like, ah, ah, I see the cherry blossoms falling in the breeze. Oh, how sad that is. Mm. It's not that. It's like, I feel terrible. This, this music, this, this, the, the, these words, this poetry, like it, it kills me. Like, because I know how bad this world is, this, these distressing times, as Honen would say. Like, and the music, as well as the poetry, reflects that. It reflects that sense, like that gut wrenching sense. It's not just getting caught up in the moment. It's like, oh, how lovely. Like, no, it's like, this, this like tears me, like this like rends me to my core. Like that's the whole point of this kind of literature. And so I think you can hear that better than you can read it. So that's why I wanted you to hear Kawamura's recitation because it, it really captures that sense of like, oh my God, <laughs> everything is so awful. <laughs> and so we begin with this reference to the bells of Gion Shoja. So this is the, the Gion Monastery in India. And in the text, so where is my text? It's right here. There we go. All right. Oh, I got to scroll way back up because I was writing my lecture notes earlier. And where are we? <clears throat> All right, here we are. The bells of the Gion Monastery in India echo with the warning that all things are impermanent. The blossoms of the solid trees teach us through their hues that what flourishes must fade. The proud do not prevail for long, but vanish like a spring night's dream. The mighty too in time succumb, all are dust before the wind. Now, initially, you might actually read this kind of in a similar vein to sort of like that sense of like mono no aware or like the sort of the aesthetic impermanence that pervades a lot of Heian period literature. But very and you see that in the sort of a phrase like the blossoms of the solid trees teach us through the hues that which what flourishes must fade. That probably could fit in a Heian literary text, but what follows would not. The proud do not prevail for long but vanish like a spring night's dream. I mean, you guys you guys read about Genji. <laughs> like, I mean, you didn't read the entirety of the Genji, but Genji's life doesn't suck. Genji goes into exile, but it's sort of a beautiful exile at one point. But then he comes back to court, and after coming back to court from exile, he basically rules the roost. Like, he pretty much controls everything as chancellor. Um, and, then, and then this bit at the end, this sort of, like, punch, like, just right to the gut. The mighty two in time succumb, all are dust before the wind. And the text means this, all are dust before the wind. Everybody, the highest, the proudest, the most aristocratic, the most noble, the most powerful, everybody is going to get it in the end. And that's really sort of the overriding, I mean, the, the reason why this is the opening bit of, of the tale is precisely because all of the characters in the text who rise to prominence at some time, at some point, bite it. <laughs> like, like they get it in the end. Like the most noble people are killed. Um, the, the best, the, the people who kill them feel so bad about it that they become monks. Like, it's a terrible world in which they live. And it's so terrible that it doesn't matter how well you do at some point. And again, this goes back to precisely what Honen was saying in his sort of description of like why pure land is so necessary is because the times themselves have degenerated us. The times themselves have made us unsuited to the sort of more noble, more virtuous, self-perfecting path. The only option that is available to us, us, the Jap you know, Japanese people of this time, the only option that is available now is to beg the Amida Buddha for salvation. That's your only option. And that idea pervades this text. This is like the Pure Land Buddhism work of literature. Like if you... If, if you can't find Pure Land Buddhism in this text, you're you're not literate. <laughs> like it's literally mentioned <laughs> several, like at many many points in the text. And so this is a fundamental. This is a fundamental transformation. We're dealing with a very different view of the world, and that is signaled right here at the very beginning of this text. But one thing that I do want to note about the way in which it is signaled. And this is why I sort of, I mentioned that initially, like these first two sentences read like they maybe could possibly come from 
a Heian period of text. It's actually, so they're taking that literary aesthetic, bringing it into a now contemporary period for them, you know? It, so like taking that early literary aesthetic, but now drastically reinterpreting it. There's a completely different understanding of what those older aesthetic ideas now mean. The times have changed them in the same way that the distressing times have changed us as individuals have degenerated us. They have also degenerated. They have changed the very meaning of those older notions of like what is beautiful and what is profound and what is interesting. And so that's why it's really important to sort of think about that transition, that sort of cultural transition that is taking place because it, it, you see it here in the literature as well. <clears throat> So as a result, then the idea of impermanence in this period really is very, very dire. And it's not just dire, but it will also take on this kind of, as, as I note here, an anxious longing for the past and the knowledge that no matter how good things may seem, they will always fade. In other words, not only do you know that it's gotten worse, from then to now, but you're also aware that now is going to get worse into the future. It's like then was better than now, and now is better than what will come. It's only going to get worse. And so that's what I mean by there's this different conception of the mapo, of sort of the decline of the Dharma. Like things have fallen apart, are falling apart, and will continue to fall apart. <laughs> And that is really, really, really nerve-wracking for, you know, the people of, of this time period. All right, the next episode that I want to look at, so I, I needed to talk about at least one episode that, that um, so Kiyomori is one of the central figures in the text, Taira no Kiyomori. So I wanted to look at at least one of them. And I thought the best one was probably the incident with Lady Gyo and Lady Hotoke, literally Lady Buddha. <laughs> as she is known. So this is starting on page 350, if I can get back to, there we go. So Lady Gyo is the, is a, she's, she's an aristocratic woman, but she's a dancer, as it says, she's a Bioshi dancer, um, who is so hot and so great that Kiyomori is totally in love with her. And he, he is so infatuated with her that he dotes on her constantly. Like he gives her this massive rice ration, which is another way of saying that she's really wealthy because rice was a, a primary currency in this period. Um, so she's, she's super wealthy because of the way in which um, Kiyomori dotes on her. And after three year, there's this three year span in which she is his favorite. But then one day this, this other dancer makes an appearance by the lady, lady name of Lady Hotoke, which literally means Buddha. So it says here, after some three years had passed, another highly skilled Shirabiyoshi dancer appeared in the capital, a native of the province of Kaga named Hotoke or Buddha, literally. She was said to be only 16. Everyone in the capital, high and low alike, again, that sort of that populist appeal, exclaimed over her, declaring that among all the Shirabiyoshi dancers of the past, none could rival her. Now, what's interesting about this is that when, so when, she starts to become well known and everybody's talking about her. What's interesting is that when Kiyomori is informed of this of her existence, he says, No, I already have Lady Gyo and she's great. She's fantastic. I love her. And so there's this there's this interesting like allegory here, because in rejecting Lady Hotoke, he's like rejecting the Buddha. Like he's turning the Buddha away. He is so infatuated. Again, it's allegorical. I mean, it's literally a woman, but because she's called the Buddha, it's like him turning away the Buddha. This is sort of a way in which the text kind of hints to, like, into, not, it's not even really hinting. It's kind of just saying it outright. That Kiyomori is, is a guy sort of like ruled by his passions, ruled by sensation. He's a tragic hero precisely because, like, Everything that happens to him and his clan results from his inability to basically keep it in his pants. Let's be real. <clears throat> but sort of there's this weird irony here because he initially turns the Buddha away, but then it's Giel who convinces him 
to actually accept her into his presence. And then when he sees Hotoke, he's so smitten with her. And he's like, well, I can't have two super hot, fantastic lady dancers on at the same time. So because he's a jerk, because he's a complete asshole, <laughs> <Say that lower. laughs> because he's a complete jerk, he actually decides to send Giol away. And this is such such a weird situation where like again so the, the the sort of the cycle of like you know rising to prominence and falling like it, it happens for Gyo as well like nobody is exempt from this like lady Gyo like who literally in the episode is revealed to be a virtuous person she's actually a good person now that's something you really need to focus on here she's a good person she does the right thing she tries to convince kiyomori of the right thing to do and he does it and how is she rewarded she's exiled she's sent away no she's not exiled but she's sent away and as a result of being sent away she loses kiyomori's favor she loses all the wealth like her life sucks she does the right thing and as a result her life sucks like even the best of us will fade so you see that theme like right here in in this episode and what's sort of gut-wrenching about it and, and again it's it's it, there there is this kind of like ugh, feeling about it precisely because like this is a good person like it's not like good people are not going to be spared like the guy who is a total jerk at least at this moment in the text kiyomori gets his in the end as well but like at this moment in the text the guy who's being a total jerk fine everything's fine and the person who is like the kind, virtuous individual, Lady Gyul, she gets it. Like, that sucks. And that's the, and that's the world that the people of the, the Kamakura period feel like they're living in. That kind of world where like, it doesn't matter what you do. Like the, the, the whole idea of like self-perfection, the idea that like you, there is a thing that you can do. There is a ritual practice. There's a mode of understanding. There's some book you can study that will lead you to the self-perfection that will free you from samsara. No, none of it works. The only thing that works as the episode will <laughs> go on to show. Uh, let's see. This is kind of a long one. Did I did I actually annotate where this was? Okay, yeah, page two sixty five. Come on, there we go. Oh, got it. It's so far down. <laughs> no, it can't be three sixty five. That must be my dyslexia creeping in. It's probably three fifty six. Yeah, let me let me change that in the. Sorry, guys. This is, once again, my dyslexia. I apologize. I mean, I shouldn't apologize for my developmental disability, but that's why I had it wrong. All right. <clears throat> so Gyo says, you were right. I would be guilty of one of the five deadly sins. I will abandon any thought of self-destruction. So he initially thinks that she's just going to kill herself. But as long as I remain in the capital, I'm likely to encounter further grief. My thought now is simply to leave. Thus, at the age of 22... Giol became a nun, and directing a simple thatched retreat in a mountain village in the recesses of the Saga region, she devoted herself to reciting the Buddha's name. Here it is. Her only salvation was to leave the capital, was to give all this stuff up, and to devote herself to, as it says, reciting the Buddha's name, literally the Nembuts. Right there. And then I, I love it's not the, quite the end, but there there is this there's this bit here further down where she and some of the other nuns that she's with it says as the nuns watch the evening sun sinking below the hills to the west again the west remember the west pure land in the west they thought to themselves that there where the sun went down was the western paradise of Amida one day we too will be will be reborn there and will no longer know these cares and sorrows they said giving themselves up to melancholy thoughts, melancholy, this sort of melancholic attitude, thoughts of this kind, their tears never ceased flowing. When the twilight hour had passed, they closed their, the door, their pleated bamboo, lit the dim lamp, and all three mother and daughters began their invocation of the Buddha's name, the Nimbuts. Your own actions, your virtue, like there's nothing you can do for yourself to save yourself the only thing you can do is to beseech the power the supernatural powers of the buddha to intervene on your behalf and hopefully when you die 
you will be reborn into this pure land, this Western paradise of the, the Amida Buddha. So there it is. Like that's sort of the, the way in which pure land Buddhism becomes so central to the way in which these this the Japanese at this time are seeing the world and sort of like understanding it in literary terms. And they're using that sort of that older literature that, that you see in the Genji, that you see in Seishonogon, they're using that sort of aesthetic appreciation for like, you know, in many ways that, that sort of that bit about, you know, the sun setting in the West and sort of observing it. You could imagine that in a Heian period tale, but their understanding of it would be very different because here it takes on a much stronger and much more serious religious connotation. Like it, ha it has a stronger religious meaning than it would for a Heian reader of something like that. And so, yeah, it's it's pretty explicit. <laughs> like you don't have to guess whether or not they're sort of Buddhist. They're not even undertones. You can't really call them undertones because the text says it. <laughs> the text says like, Buddha, <laughs> it's like pure land, Buddha. Nimbus, <laughs> like it's just it's just there. It's like in flashing neon lights. You don't have to wonder. It's right there. All right. So the the next vignette that I want to talk about is another really really famous one. It's the um, the death of Atsumori. So this is on three seventy four. Okay. So we're gonna skip a lot again. Scroll, 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 scroll. Oh geez, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I just these these like all the stuff about like Tadanori. I don't I don't care. Like, and you guys probably won't care either. Or maybe you do, and you're like, why did you skip over all the cool battle stuff? It's like because the cool battle stuff isn't actually as cool as you think it is. Plus, we're going to be reading the Taiheiki, which has lots of cool battle stuff. So that'll be fun anyway. All right, here we go. The death of Atsumori. So who is Atsumori? So Taira no Atsumori is is a, is, a, is the nephew of Kiyomori, I think. Don't quote me on that. I'm literally saying that off the top of my head. Um, anyway, he's a really, really prominent member of the clan. Um, and so the the Taira and the Minamoto at this point have just clashed in an epic battle, the Battle of Ichinotani, and the Taira lost really, really bad. So, so hey, okay, I should note here. So Heika here is another way. Of, so Heika literally means like the Taira clan. That's what the word means. So Heika is the Taira. And also the Genji, as they're sometimes called in this text, that's, um, that's the Minamoto. So the Heika had lost the battle. Those Taira lords will be heading for the shore in hopes of making their getaway by boat, <laughs> thought Kumagai Naozanai to himself. Fine, I'll go look for one of their generals to grapple with and turned his horse in the direction of the beach. So here we have, this is not the first example of like the quintessential like warriors clashing in battle, like two noble warriors struggling for dominance. Like this is not the first example of this in a, in a military tale. It is probably the most quintessential one. It's the one that especially like later Japanese literature and especially later Japanese media constantly refer to for couple of reasons that I'll get into. So you have this guy, uh, in fact, his full name isn't even given here. Kumagai uh, no Jiro na Naozane, I believe is his full name. Sometimes he's referred to as Jiro, but um, in this case, uh, but typically he's usually referred to as Kumagai. He's usually referred to as by his family name. Atsumori is usually referred to by his given name because there are many, many Taira <laughs> in this text. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is important about the death of Atsumori? So as I noted, he like his is sort of the quintessential warrior's death. Um, so Taira no Atsumori encounters Kumaga, why did Kumaga, A, eh, sorry. No Jiro Naozane after the Taira, wow, man, I must've written this really fast, are defeated. <laughs> at Ichinotane and is slain by him. So one of the interesting things about the encounter between Atsumori and uh, Kumagai is Atsumori's beauty. So where is this? So the, the two begin to clash, the rider acknowledging the call. So this is this is a typical thing. So in particularly this period in Japanese military history, battles often occurred in like three parts, but it was a common thing for like someone to like ride out in front of their forces and call out somebody else to sort of fight one-on-one. -on -one. And so this is sort of hearkening back to that. Um, the rider acknowledging the call, 
turned toward the beach. As he was about to ride up out of the waves, Kumagai drew alongside and grappled with him. And this is another important thing to know that, um, so we oftentimes think of like, you know, warrior culture in Japan is like the way of the sword. These dudes mostly, I mean, they had swords and they fought with them, but like they also wrestled. <laughs> There's actually a lot of wrestling. And in fact, there are, there are stories told uh, specifically about Yoritomo and his his household in Kamakura. One of the things that he would do with his warriors is that when they would have a big feast, he would have like big wrestling matches afterwards. And the reason for this is because like being able to wrestle your opponent was actually a really important military skill. Like, yeah, wrestling was important. They wrestled. They did it. Dragging him from his horse, pinning him down so as to cut off his head, Kumagai pushed aside his helmet. So, so he tackles him to the ground. He rips off his helmet, and you know he pulls out his sword, or possibly even um, a sort of like long knife that they would use, but probably his sword actually. So he, you know, he's he's got his sword, and he's looking for a way to like chop Atsumoni's head off. And then just as he's about to chop his head off, pinning him down so he could cut off his head, Kumagai pushed aside his helmet. The face he saw was that of a young man of sixteen or seventeen lightly powdered and with blackened teeth now this is important because the thing is like the way in which atsumori is described is actually having a beauty similar to that of a woman so there's a kind of homoeroticism here in the text now it immediately kind of gets shifted into the like oh he looks just like my son territory but there's this moment where it's like <gasps> Like he's actually kind of stunned by Atsumori's beauty initially. Gazing at the boy's handsome face, Kumagai realized, so this is uh, right here, realized that he was just the age of his own son, Kojiro, and he could not bring himself to use his sword. Who are you? Tell me your name and I'll let you go, he said. Who are you? asked the young man. No one of great importance. Again, no one of great importance. So you have this figure in the tale, like, Unlike before, unlike you know, in Heian literature where everybody's an aristocrat, kind of really of some kind, here we have somebody who's kind of a bit of a nobody, like rising into a position. So somebody rising into a position of prom uh, prominence, and then we'll see at the end of the episode falling back down again. <clears throat> Kumagai and Aozane of the province of Musashi. Musashi is famous for um, its warriors and like warrior dudes. Then there's no need for me to tell you my name, the young man replied. I'm worthy enough to be your opponent. When you take my head, ask someone who I am. They won't. And then it's revealed later, like I, I, the entire time that Kumagai is fighting him, he doesn't actually know that, who this is. It's only later when the head and the, the arms are brought before Yoshitsune that they recognize him as Atsumori and then everybody cries because Atsumori is so beautiful. And it's so sad that such a great noble individual has died. But the encounter between them is really very, like, it, it's an interesting one precisely because, like, Kumagai is not only re reticent to sort of, like, kill him because he's, like, his son, but also because he is a, he is this noble individual. It's like, I don't have any reason to kill you. It's like, it's, in many ways, again, it's, it's sort of implied that it's the degeneracy of the times that have put someone like Kumagai in this situation to kill somebody that he otherwise wouldn't. Like, I would have no reason, I, Kumagai, would have, I being Kumagai in this instance, like, I would have no reason to kill you. And he wants to let him go. And in fact, even in the moment of, like, being, when he's about to cut off his head, like, he literally is crying. He's so overwhelmed. He says, and again, we have this allusion to sort of sell, rather than fall into someone's hands, it's better that I kill you. I'll see that prayers are said for your salvation in life to come. Again, the Nimbuts. It's all, like I said, it's all over this text. Kumagai was so overcome with pity that he did not know where to strike. He just, he doesn't know what to do. His eyes seemed to dim, his wits to desert him. And for a moment, he hardly knew where he was. But then he realized that for all his tears, no choice was left to him. And he struck off the boy's head. It's the circumstances, it's the degeneracy of the world. He is broken by the times. They compel him to do this thing that he really doesn't want to do. We men who bear arms, how wretched is our lot, he said. If I had not been born of a warrior family, if I had not been born into these circumstances, would I have ever faced a task like this? What a terrible thing I have done. This is bad. I know it's bad. Killing you is bad. 
Again and again, he repeated the words as he raised his sleeve to brush the tears from his face. And Kumagai, in fact, in many ways, what's interesting about the sort of the famous Atsumori episode is that Atsumori is kind of a secondary figure in it. Really, the important figure in this episode is Kumagai. And as it says here, they, they recognize that sorry, it was subsequently learned that the young man slain by Kumagai was Atsumori. But then at the end, he he notices that amongst the, the, the things that he takes from Atsumori, there's this flute. Um, unfortunately, I don't know why they exerted the episode in this way, but they didn't include, like the episode actually begins with um, Kumagai and his men hearing the sort of like beautiful music coming from the Genji camp. And he thinks to himself, oh, that's so amazing. It sucks that such a beautiful thing could exist in this world. And then it's at this moment that Kumagai realizes that the person playing the flute that he heard that morning was Atsumori. He killed the man who had done this thing that had moved him so deeply. And that, and that crushes him, actually. The flute in question, and this is all this other. Uh, where is this? It is moving to think that for all their exaggerated phrases and flowery embellishments, even music and the arts can, in the end, lead a man to praise the Buddha's way. So he's so overcome by this that the only thing that is left to him is to, is to is, again, is to, like, it's, it's the Pure Land Path, it's the Nembutsu. Like this, this whole situation destroys him personally like his personal virtues are rent asunder like he can't hold on and the only solution that a person has in that kind of situation where they compelled to do something that they even know is so heinous so terrible is to sort of turn to this like divine intervention not only on his own behalf but also on behalf of the person that he killed again Kumagai is a virtuous individual. He knows what is right and wrong. But that doesn't matter. The circumstances have made it such that he is a broken person. In the same way that, again, going back to what Honen was saying about the importance of Pure Land as like the new way of doing the Buddhism, like the times have broken us. We can't engage in this form of self-perfection. It's not really available to us because we're broken people. And then you see that here. You see that in the person of Kumagai. I, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. I really like the, the Heike Monogatari. I think it's schmaltzy in a lot of ways, but sort of it's this sense of like, like it has a sense of tragedy that Han literature really doesn't. That's just me. Like, you know, I like Han period literature, but especially, like I said, I really like Sei Shonagon, but like none of those authors have this. They don't have this. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Okay, so a bit about the the Battle of Danoda. So the that sort of the culminating, the sort of the the major battle that brings the the civil war to a close, and really it's just sort of mopping up after that point. There is this like titanic clash between the um, the fleet, it's a naval battle, between the, the Minamoto, the Genji fleet, under the command of Yoshitsune, and they completely overwhelm the, the Taira forces at the Shimonoseki Strait. Um, for those of you who don't know, this, so actually let's go back to our Google map and I can show you where it is. So uh, so this is this is Honshu, you have Hiroshima over here. So this is the, the southernmost tip of Honshu. And if we zoom in, so you see how there's this like S curve here. So this bit here, so you even see uh, Shimonoseki City right there. So this is the Shimonoseki Strait. Danoda is like here-ish. Anyway, so their naval forces, the the Taira force naval forces have gathered there because their their base of power is primarily in like the western part of Japan and the Minamoto have finally pushed them out of the capital and the Minamoto are now trying, the Genji are now descending on them and trying to like finally finish them off. And they have overwhelming numbers. And this is, it's important that they have overwhelming numbers. Again, it's important. I, in fact, I'm realizing this in hindsight. <laughs> it's important that they have overwhelming numbers. One, because the Taira are actually, were supposedly like much better sailors, much better like on the water. 
but also it's that sense of like the 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 Minamoto clan itself is this ineluctable force it can't be resisted like the Taira are going to be crushed no matter what, simply because there is this overwhelming power that is going to descend upon them and defeat them. Um, but also at the same time, then like the text tries to claim that Yoshitsune is this like brilliant genius. It's like you can't have it both ways. Either Yoshitsune is a brilliant, br brilliant tactical genius, or is it was just an overwhelming force and it was inevitable and it was going to happen anyway. But that's one of the contradictions of the text. Um, one of the important aspects at the very end of the Battle of Danouda is the drowning of the former emperor Antoku. So An who is Antoku? Antoku is a kid. Um, he's eight years old. In fact, he's no, not quite eight years old. I think he's seven at this point. Um, so Antoku is this child that Kiyomori had tried to install as emperor as part of his power play to sort of take over the machinations of the government. Because who better to like control as emperor than a kid? <laughs> a kid's not going to try and rule on his own behalf. So, you know, it's an excellent choice. Um, Antoku is ousted. Um, replaced by the 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 imperial uh, successor that the Minamoto favor, and so Antoku and his retinue are on the run. Um, so he's accompanied by his grandmother, who is a Buddhist nun. You know, Buddhism once again, the Buddha way. And she commits suicide by essentially like grabbing him and like hurling herself and the boy into the sea in this moment where the sort of like almost, this is one I think the more schmaltzy moments where she grabs him and she hurls the, the, the two of them into the sea, reciting the the Nembutsu, the, the, the prayer to the Amida Buddha the entire time. Dressed in a dove, so this is right here. This is the description of Antoku. And again, um, okay, actually, no, let's go a little bit further. So first she admonishes him. She says, first you must face east so there's the, so th there's an east west thing going on here. You must face east and bid farewell to the goddess of the grand shrine of Issa. So Issa is east of where they are in Danouda. Then you must turn west. So you turn east to sort of like the the ancestral deities of you know the Japanese polity. Now you must turn west and trust in Amida Buddha to come with his host to greet you and lead you to his pure land. So there's actually a weird sort of syncretism here because this is a former emperor. <clears throat> there is his like obligation as sort of the central religious figure of sort of Shintoism, of, of sort of like native Japanese religion, to sort of acknowledge the sun goddess um, while at the same time, so there's the, there's the duty that he as a, a, as a religious figure has to perform on behalf of the Japanese people to acknowledge the sun goddess, <clears throat> while at the same time, to save himself, he must look to the west and to Amida Buddha to come with his host to greet you and lead you to his pure land. And then it says in the following paragraph, starting right here, dressed in a dove gray robe, his hair now done in boyish loops on either side of his head, the child, his face his face bathed in tears, pressed his small hands together. So you could see, knelt down and bowed first to the east. So east for me is, oh, this is mirrored. Anyway, east, <laughs> the shrine of Issa, and then west, <clears throat> then he turned toward the west and began chanting the Nembutsu, in the invocation of Amida's name. The nun took him in her arms, comforting him. She said, there's another capital down there beneath the waves. So they plunged to the bottom of the thousand fathom sea. So she makes him do this prayer and he's singing this prayer and she grabs him. And as he's praying and she's praying and they hurl them, there's another capital at the bottom of the sea. That's actually kind of a moving moment. Like I said, there's aspects of this that I find a little schmaltzy, but it is what it is. But what's interesting about this bit, and the, th the thing that I want to focus on, is actually the, the last paragraph of, of the episode. <clears throat> uh, no, 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 it's the next to last paragraph. Sorry, it's this one. All right. How pitiful that the spring winds of impermanence, again, this notion of impermanence, re-understood, should so abruptly scatter the beauty of the blossoms. How heartless that the rough waves of reincarnation should engulf this tender body. Long life is the name they give to the imperial palace, signaling that one should reside there for years unending. Its gates are dubbed ageless, a term that speaks of a reign forever young. Yet before he had reached the age of 10, this ruler ended as refuse on the ocean floor. Again, the end comes for all of us. 
for emperors, for nobodies, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how high you rise. It doesn't matter like whether or not you think that like, you know, the eternal reign of the eternal emperor of the eternal empire of the ageless gates, like it doesn't matter because he too ended up as like, like the dust in the wind from the, from the very beginning of the, of the tale. Here he is garbage on the ocean floor. That's what's in store for you. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little heavy there for a second. Uh, yeah, so no one, no one is above the vicissitudes of the world. And so again, this emphasis on like, at the, in the final moment, the only thing that is available to you, Amida Buddha, the Nembuts, that's it. It's the only thing left. It's all you got. Salvation from a higher power, that's it. It's all it's available to you. All right, <clears throat> the very last uh, episode that I'm going to talk about today, and it also happens to be the last episode in the entire tale, is the the um, the former empress who is now a nun, Kenrei Munin. So what's interesting about the way the tale ends is that it ends well after everything, the sort of the events of the Genpei War have all played out. Everything's been done. Like it, the the last episode alludes to like what became of all the like the Taira who survived, very few. <laughs> um, what became of their wives? They basically lived in punery. Like they all fell. The great Taira who began the tale as you know the with Kiyomori and all of the the greats that all fell apart for them as well. But what's interesting is that sort of this the the, the final episode in the tale. begins with, right here, while they were speaking, the bell of the Jakoin sounded. So this is actually a temple in Kyoto, or actually it's just outside Kyoto now that I think about it, signaling the close of the day and the sun sank beyond the Western Hills. And again, this is an echo, an echo of what we heard, of what we saw at the very, very beginning of the tale. So the, 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 res, the, the resonating bell, uh, the bells of the Gion Monastery in India signal the, 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 all things must pass from this world. And here, even though it doesn't say all of that, it doesn't explain what it means, but you do get the sound of the bell. The bell is a reminder of what was said all the way back at the beginning. And this text is really long. This text says what? 13 books? <laughs> it's, like it's, it's actually a really long thing. I didn't have you read anywhere near a, a substantial chunk of it. So yeah, this, so this really super long text is now once again calling back to the very beginning. And not only is it calling back in the sense of sort of this like literary parallel, but also like there is a bit here where it talks about Kiyomori's sins. Did I know what page this is on? Yes, thank God. It's on page 381. And all this came about because the lay priest and prime minister, Taira no Kiyomori, holding the entire realm within the four seas in the palm of his hand, he had everything. He had this whole country to himself, showed no respect for the ruler above with the slightest concern for the masses of common people below. He dealt out sentences of death or exile in any fashion that suited him. He was a jerk. Took no heed of how the world or those in it might view his actions. And this is what happened. There could be no room for doubt. It was the evil deeds of the father, the patriarch, that caused the heirs and offspring to suffer this retribution. Now, there's a couple of things here. One, it's clearly tying back into this notion of like, we're all doomed. Like we're doomed by our circumstances. There's nothing that we could have possibly done about it. But there's also sort of an interesting like allusion to like Japanese belief, like at least about like ancestor worship. The idea that sort of like who your ancestors are ha have this like determinative, like almost fate-like function in your life. So again, that's one thing I'm doing. So there's this like pre, almost like pre-Buddhist notion of like the way in which like our ancestors influence our lives. Like that's still in here in this text. But also it's interesting that sort of like the, the idea of melancholy as expressed in literature has gone from sort of what we see saw in the Han period, where as I have here, like, oh, hey, weren't things great back then? 
were things so much better in the past? Kind of like, you know, wish we could go back to then. That was great. To in the the Kamakura period, it's like we're all doomed. <laughs> Everything's wrong. <laughs> we're all gonna die. <laughs> it doesn't matter what we do. We're all effed. <laughs> so there's this there's this huge huge shift where it's just like, oh well, you know, things used to be better. It kind of sucks now, but whatever. But now it's like, oh my god, <laughs> we're all screwed. <laughs> so yeah, there's this there's this huge shift, and yet, and yet, and this is the point I want to end on. Despite all the doom and gloom, the end of the tale, the very, 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 very end of the tale still holds out hope for salvation. So let's take a look at that real quick. Let's take a look at that last bit. So, actually, let's start up here. After some time had gone by, Ken Raymonin fell ill. Grasping the five-color cord attached to the hand of Amida Buddha, the central figure in the sacred triad, she repeatedly invoked his name. Again, Nembuts. Do it. Do the Nembuts. You'll thank me later. The nuns, Danagon Nosuke and Awano Naishi, attended her on her left and right, their voices raised in unrestrained weeping, for they sensed in their grief that her end was now at hand, as the sound of the dying woman's recitations grew fainter and fainter. A purple cord appeared from the west. What? <laughs> the room became filled with a strange fragrance, and the strains of music could be heard in the sky. Human life has its limits, and that of the Imperial Lady ended in the middle days of the second month in the second year of the Kenku era. Her two female attendants, who from time to time <clears throat> she became Imperial Consort, had never once been parted from her, were beside themselves with grief at her passing, helpless though they were to avert it. The support on which they had depended from times past had now been snatched from them, and they were left destitute. These women, who were like faithful servants, who were the best of the best, they, were, they did nothing wrong, nothing wrong, everything right. Yet even in that pitiable state, they managed to hold memorial, and even after she is dead, managed to hold memorial services each year on the anniversary of, death, of her death, despite the fact that they're dirt poor. And in due time, they too, we are told, imitating the example of the Dragon King's daughter in her attainment of enlightenment and following in the footsteps of Queen Vaidei, this, uh, this Indian queen, I don't know, fulfilled their long cherished hopes for rebirth in the Pure Land. That's it. That's, that's the whole deal. Um, and I mean, that's also it for me <laughs> for, for, for today. So I'll, I'll end the share. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I hate to end on such a, hopeful downer i don't know if it is a downer or if it's hopeful but um that's where we are for this week again um as i read as i noted at the beginning of the the previous video for this week like if you have questions ask come on guys ask me questions like really it, when i have to teach a class in this way it is very boring for me so if you could just like entertain me by like sending me your curious questions, I would actually really appreciate it. Um, but uh, so that's it for now. Um, and until next week, um, stay safe, um, wear a mask, do everything you can to survive the um, plague land. Well, most of you are not living in the plague land. I'm living in the plague land. So that's fun. But do everything to stay healthy. And I hope to see you on the flip side. Bye.